So uh, first up, we have um, Dr. Akter, uh, who's going to show us a case of debulking of a large tricuspid bowel vegetation with a large bore manual aspiration system. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shiroz Akter. I'm a third year medical student at, from the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. And I'll be presenting a case on behalf of Dr. Akter. No relation, but he's an interventionist out in Tenova, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, so we'll be presenting a case on debulking of a large tricuspid, tricuspid valve vegetation with a large bore manual aspiration system, the AlphaVac by Angiodynamics. Um, how do I advance this? Give me the green button. The green button. The green button. That'll take it up next slide. Cool. All right, just a brief introduction. Tricuspid valve infective endocarditis is a very real and recognized consequence of intravenous drug use. Um, patients who are septic and have respiratory failure and given their social history, may be poor candidates for surgical debulking or valvular, uh, valvular re replacement. So in this case report, we performed a percutaneous aspiration with Alphavac, uh, a new multipurpose manual aspiration device, which is used specifically for right-sided cardiac masses and thrombi. So just, let's just jump into the case. We have a 24-year-old male with ongoing history of IV drug use, heroin use, who's presented to an outside facility with shortness of breath, fevers, and chills. CT of the lungs showed multilobal infiltrate suspicion of septic emboli, and the echo showed about a 2.7 by 2.5 centimeter vegetation on the tricuspid valve with mild TR. So we start on broad spectrum, broad spectrum antibiotics, bank, and later the blood cultures were positive for MRSA, so we added Tiflaro. So following a two-week course of antibiotics, the septicemia was worsening, and the vegetation was enlarging. Um, so we referred to CT and given CT and IDs consult, um, he was a poor, again, a poor candidate for surgery, given his ongoing drug use and uh, respiratory status. So he was referred to us for percutaneous aspiration. Um, so our initial aspiration was done with the Penumbra Lightning 12 system. So we proceeded with debulking with this system and uh, we left a residual of 1.7 by 0.9 centimeters. Um, so the patient came back 10 days later Repeat cultures, grew MRSA, and he again had leukocytosis and fever, although he was hemodynamically stable. So the re repeat echo showed enlarging vegetation, um, as you can see right here, it's quite prominent. Um, so then we were again referred, re we ended up doing an aspiration with uh, the AlphaVac system right here, as you can see. So it's a three piece system, you can see the, the handle, the pump, it can be used to pump 10 cc's or 30 cc's, and it has the waistline and the cannula. Our setup was slightly different. This is a 20 degree, um, but as you'll see, we used a 180 degree. Um, so just to go through the procedure, it was performed under conscious sedation. The ice probe was inserted through the left femoral, and the vegetation was, in fact, enlarging. Um, it was measured at 3.3 centimeters. Um, so we advanced our alpha vac over the stiff amplatzer wire into the right atrium and we performed three manual aspirations for a total, total of 90 cc's, um, and there was no change in the uh, mild TR. So here's a fluoroscopy of, of our positioning. As you can see on the left, we have the, the ice probe and the amplatzer wire placed into the right atrium, and on the right image, you can see the, um, the alpha vac catheter kind of at the level of the tricuspid valve. So that was kind of our entry and approach. So this is a quick video of the aspiration. If I could pause it, that'd be cool. I think it's self-explanatory. Yeah, right there. We kind of capture the vegetation. Okay, cool. So just a little pathology. The pathology of the, the aspirate was um, it was just neutrophilic and necrotic in nature. And again, there was no valvular material or, material or myocardium. As I said, the, the uh, tricuspid regurg wasn't worsened following the aspiration. So patient was discharged home after five days in the hospital, and he has not be re has been readmitted um, in the year we've been treating him, but there is ongoing drug use still. So, so in conclusion, this was the first reported successful case of using al AlphaVac um, to treat TVIE in, the, in our state, at least, that we know of. Um, the manual aspiration with this large bore manual device is feasible, safe, and effective in debulking these masses, these tricuspid valve vegetations. Um, it, it, it serves as a possible alternative to open heart surgery, reduces hospitalization stay complications and the burden to the healthcare system, as well it could possibly use as a, a bridging to surgery. 
In conclusion, you know, we need some further studies on this to determine the long-term efficacy. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. That, that was excellent. Um, I guess I'll start off with a question. Uh, did this patient have any um, septic pulmonary emboli from this vegetation or any issues with pneumonia related to it? Um, in the past medical history, he didn't have a history of pneumonia, but I think on the initial CT it showed uh, like the bilateral patchy infiltrates suggestive of an embolic pattern, but we didn't see any like systemic embolization or anything like that, yeah. yeah. And I guess just another follow-up quick question. So in the world of uh, tricuspid valve aspiration of vegetations like this, for those who do it, uh, what are the plan B or backup options if there were to be any significant leaflet tearing or damage during aspiration or is the risk of that very low? Uh, how, how would that be handled? Is it just basically surgery or are there other options? Um, that's a wonderful question. Um, I would definitely have to look into that, but I think, surg I think surgical intervention would definitely be needed at that point. I'm not familiar with the specifics though, but definitely I would look into that. Any other comments or questions from our panelists or the audience? I think it's probably just on me. Is it on? Uh, great case. Uh, with these aspiration catheters, um, there is a risk of injury to the tricuspid valve. It would have been nice to see any kind of color Doppler. But um, after aspiration, was there any residual vegetation left? Oftentimes, we can't get the entire vegetation. Yeah, so there was a, a little, um, if I could go back. On the pathology, at the bottom image is the, the large vegetations aspirated with the alphavac, and there were some re residuals left, and we used the penumbra system to get those smaller vegetations out, and that's kind of at the top, top, at the top side of the image. But I believe we got all of the, most all of the vegetation removed with the aspiration. Cool. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you. So. Thank you. So um, we'll move on to our next presentation. So Dr. Al Sayed is going to talk about challenging percutaneous mitral valvioplasty cases. Osama from Cairo University in Egypt. I will be presenting challenging percutaneous mitral valve blast cases. We have two cases. The first case is 38 year female patient complaining of Disney on routine activity. Uh, on examinations, there was diastolic rumbling murmur over the apex. The echo shows the rheumatic mitral stenosis, uh, but the valve is pliable with no significant mitral regurgitation. In the short axis, both commissions are fused, and the valve area about one. Uh, the mean gradient across the valve is 20 millimeter mercury. We start the, the procedure as usual. The big tail catheter in the aortic uh, route for guiding, and transeptal uh, uh, catheterization, and then left enteral injection for confirmation of the position. Then spring wire was introduced into the left atrium. On the next step, several attempts to negotiate the balloon into the LV were failed, so we decided to do a posterior loop. The style it was rotated clockwise, and the balloon tip was directed towards posterior inferior left atrial wall, forming a posterior loop. Now the balloon is facing the mitral valve, and we could cross the mitral valve into the LV. The distal part of the balloon was inflated, then pulled back, and full inflation of the NW balloon was successful dilatation of the mitral valve. Most of the procedural echo showing uh, opening of the medial commissure and valve area was 1.9. There was mild mitral regurgitation and the mean gradient dropped to six millimeter mercury. The second case is uh, much complicated. A 33 year male patient with Disney on mild activity. On an auscultation, there was accentuated S1 and diastolic rumbling murmur over the apex. The echo showing the mitral stenosis, fear mitral stenosis with no mitral regurgitation. Fused both commissures with valve area 1.1 and mean gradient of 11 millimeter mercury. 
the uh, same procedure with the big tail in the aortic root and transeptal puncture, then left atrial injection, uh, spring wire into the uh, left atrium. Here, uh, multiple attempts to cross the mitral valve were, were failed, even with the posterior loop. So we decided to do venoarterial loop. A hydrophilic trauma wire was introduced through the inner balloon into the left ventricle and all the way to, into the ascending aorta through aortic valve. Then a snare from the arterial sheath was introduced. Successful snaring of the trauma wire was done and then slight withdrawal, establishing venoarterial loop. Now with enough support, the balloon could be slid uh, over the wire across the mitral valve into the LV, then balloon inflation, distal, and proximal, and the mid part was successful dilatation of the mitral valve. Uh, Post-operative echo showed medial commissure uh, opening and valve area about 1.7 and mean gradient of 5 millimeter mercury. There was no significant mitral regurgitation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my take-home messages uh, from these cases: failure to cross the mitral valve is reported in about two percent of balloon mitral valve blast cases. This difficulty uh, may come from large left atrium, uh, low or anterior transeptal puncture, uh, very severe uh, uh, mitral and subvalvular or mitral stenosis. To overcome this situation, uh, you, you can uh, change the site of transeptal puncture. You can do posterior loop or, uh, in the second case, venoarterial loop. The venoarterial loop technique is safe, cost-effective. However, gentle manipulation is required to avoid injury to the mitral or aortic valve. And thank you. So, um, you know, uh, definitely in the U.S., we don't see as much rheumatic mitral stenosis, and I admittedly they probably only do about eight or ten a year, and I'm still amazed when I see operators outside the U.S. who are able to do this without any sort of real-time imaging, yeah. uh, especially echo-based imaging. So how do you intra-procedurally determine, okay, stop, I need to balloon a little bit more, balloon a little bit less, do I have more MR? How do you kind of make that, what's your algorithm in the middle of the procedure when you do that? Sometimes we do transesophageal echo, but it required general anesthesia, which is not readily available in our uh, center at least. So we do uh, just transesophageal Trans echo after the procedure, assess for mitral gauge, for commissure. If, the, if the, everything is okay, okay. Uh, if not, we can do another uh, inflammation and reassessment by transesophageal echo. Got it. So do you wait till the patient leaves to do the echo, or do you write on the table you no, throw no, the echo probe uh, on? bedside echo on Got the it. table, on the yeah. catheter table. Yeah, I mean, I, we're fortunate. We have, you know, we use a lot of intracardiac echo uh -huh. to help guide just the transeptal puncture, but you can also bring that into the RV, and then yeah. you can assess gradients, you can assess uh, residual regurgitation, and then make a decision if you want to add an extra CC course, and, course, and, yes. and go a little bit bigger. Uh, I've certainly used the PA, the posterior loop, it's very helpful. I've never had to do a rail yet, but it's a very nifty technique, a kind yes. of... Um, you know, we've been doing a lot more tendine cases now, and for MAC cases, it's, it's the easiest balloon, you know, valvioplasty I've ever had to do because you basically advance a wire from the apex into the left atrium, you snare it, and then and you externalize it from the vein, and then you bring in your inway balloon, and it just pops right through. Yes. But these are for MAC cases. This isn't yes. for rheumatic stenosis. Mm -hmm. So having a rail is, is very attractive. So any other questions or comments? Yeah, I was just going to say, first of all, a great case. Uh, of course, you know, it's always amazing, like you said, Guggen, that uh, when you see individuals doing transeptals under floor, I mean, <laughs> I think the last time I had to do that was in fellowship, you know, and that was just based on an attending that was, you know, equally, you know, significantly aged that he had the ability to do it. But I don't think at this day and age we ever utilize uh, just fluoro. Obviously, it's ice or, or TE, but I did see one of the critiques there that you had to avoid the crossing if you had done more of a posterior or superior stick. So yes, at your yes. center, do you have the ability to utilize ice if you can't do TE? Uh, no, we don't have ice in our uh, center, but we have TE. Uh, one option is to do another transeptal puncture, but uh, it would take another time and zit. Uh, fluoroscopy work fine with us, uh, with uh, fluoroscope guiding, but I you know TE is better or intracardiac. Yeah. Much better. And how many valvoplasties do you think you do in a year? Uh, about 30 cases. Per 30 case. cases. And how many of them do you feel like you need to do the, the VA rail? Uh, no, I, 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 just this one just case the first uh, one. I did. Cool. Yeah, just a 
couple of quick thoughts just to piggyback on uh, Dr. Singh's comments. So one of the challenges we have here is that we don't see a lot of these bread and butter rheumatic yes. MS cases like the excellent cases that you showed. Yes. And uh, we'll routinely get referrals that, hey, this is a patient with severe mitral stenosis and they're sending the patient to us for consideration of alveoplasty. And I've gotten into the habit over the last three, four years of putting these patients through a thorough imaging evaluation because what I often find is that they're actually better candidates for a valve and MAC procedure or in some rare cases, uh, actually, the problem is not really mitral stenosis, but there's more regurgitation than what was originally thought, mm -hmm. and they might need a clip in MAC or some other therapy, uh, which would be you know, 180 degrees different from the original referral reason. So I, in addition to getting TEEs and Wilkins scores and all, all the standard stuff that I'm sure we all do to look at the anatomy, I also routinely CT these patients. And if I see a large spicule of calcium on the leaflets or yes. anything that I think could create a risk for severe MR with a valvioplasty, I, I would not do a valvioplasty yes. and look for some valve replacement therapy option for those patients. And the last quick comment I wanted to make is that I don't know if any of our panelists have experience with this, so please chime in, but I've done a couple of cases where I did not use an Inua balloon, but used a different balloon, such as an Atlas Gold or a True balloon. Double trick. And I had good results. That there was no damage to the valve and significant reduction of the gradient without anything more than mild MR. So I do, uh, maybe to be a little provocative, I guess I'm kind of wondering, what do you all think about doing valvuloplasties for mitral stenosis using other types of balloons besides the Inua, which has certain FDA regulations and frankly is a little bit, you know, technically a little bit difficult or challenging in terms of the, you know, the multiple different steps involved. If you're not doing a lot of it, you always have to, you know, review the instructions pamphlet before your case. Okay. Any comments on that? So I worked with a pediatric uh, interventionalist who did a lot of these valvoplasties in the past, and he used a double balloon technique in order to do his uh, mitral valvoplasty. So we used to do those even in adults when he was working with us, and we had good success. Uh, so you can use that option if you don't have an NOA. Um, I mean, you had wonderful cases, great images, low Wilkins score on both patients. I just wanted to bring up the second patient did have asymmetric, asymmetric commissure fusion. And in these patients, they're higher risk of leaflet tearing with valvoplasty. So that's something that, you know, we should pay attention to in the pre-procedural setting. So great cases. Yes, that's true. That's a good one. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've used for rheumatic mitral stenosis, uh, younger patients like this, predominantly just uh, in a way, I've never used anything beyond that. But now that we're embarking on non-rheumatic mitral stenosis patients, uh, either with Tendine um, or Valvin Mac, in those patients we've certainly used kind of, you know, standard um, valvuloplasty balloons and they're effective. And, and that's interesting, you know, the, the, the dogma has always been for non-rheumatic mitral stenosis, which we have a lot more in this country. Yes. Uh, and, you know, you don't balloon those because you're going to disrupt the annulus, you're going to fracture the annulus, you're gonna, patients are going to die on the table. We're doing it routinely now for tendine and MAC cases, and the patients do fine. Um, so we've had this discussion internally. If you have patients with MAC, then they have, um, you know, mitral stenosis, and they have and they're symptomatic, and they're not a candidate. Should we just do a quote unquote gentle balloon? Uh, the question always becomes, what's the bailout if it doesn't work, and if you have a problem? Um, there have been a group of uh, very brave physicians that have taken lithotripsy balloons. Uh, they've taken multiple peripheral lithotripsy balloons and kind of delivered lithotripsy to the leaflets, to the annulus, to, to break it up in non-rheumatic um, mitral stenosis, MAC-related uh, mitral stenosis. And so I'm certainly not that brave. I don't know if, if I've tried that. but So that's something we talk about often at our institution and just remind the audience that the MAC, mitral annual calcification, grows from the base towards the leaflet tips, whereas with rheumatic it tends to be the opposite from the leaflet tips towards the base. And so the valves... Um, are more pliable in the rheumatic cases and do better with valvoplasty. So we don't traditionally, um, we haven't been doing valvoplasties in MAC cases, but you know we just got enrolled in the MAC arm for the yeah. tendine, so I'm looking forward to trying some. Yeah, do it, you, it do you protect? It, do you do sentinel? No, we usually don't, but usually what it does, it, it basically mobilizes the spicules, and in some of the cases, you know, the leaflet tips are spared, but the bases of the, of the leaflet tips or the leaflets are somewhat immobile. And it just kind of makes them a little bit more mobile. Out of we've, I think we've done maybe 10 or 15 tendine cases. We've not seen a single case where you do the valvioplasty and all of a sudden the patient gets torrential MR. Uh, and that hasn't happened. And so that has been encouraging uh, to see. So. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you.
Next, we have uh, Dr. Tori Brown, who's going to discuss a curious case of clot in transit across three cardiac chambers and novel use of an angiovac. I'm curious about this. <laughs> Yes, very curious. So um, I'm Tori. I'm a second year resident at the University of Kentucky. And like he said, we'll be talking about the curious case of a clot in transit. All right. So to start off, um, we have a 74 year old female. She has a history of cardiomyopathy with a BIV ICD placed. She has proxismal AFib, COPD on home oxygen, um, CKD stage three, OSA, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, as well as prior DVT. Um, I would joke that this is like the standard Kentucky <laughs> patient. Um, so she came to our ED with the chief complaint of shortness of breath, chest pain, and had been having an increased home oxygen requirement. Of note, this patient had underwent a hernia repair about a month ago before she came to the ED, and her apixaban had been held by her surgery team due to concern for post-op hematoma, and unfortunately was not restarted within that month. Um, so when she got there, she had a CTA that demonstrated extensive bilateral PEs with an enlarged um, RV. She had an echocardiogram um, in the ED as well that showed severely dilated right ventricle. Um, she also had flattening of the septum, and her RSVP was estimated above 55. The biggest thing on her echo was a mobile intracardiac thrombus that extended all the way from her RV into the RA through a PFO and into her left atrium. Um, she also had lower extremity Dopplers, which of course showed acute bilateral DVTs. Um, surgery team was initially consulted, um, vascular and CT surgery. They both declined to take this patient to the operating room due to her comorbidities and her risks. Um, so they called our team um, for an angiovac and cath. Um, there was no relevant cath findings. Um, but what we did was uh, aspiration with an angiovac. Um, so the patient was planned for angiovac thrombectomy, um, and we did use ice during the procedure and closed her PFO. Um, ultrasound guidance was also used to confirm that there was no thrombus in her um, common fem um, before access was obtained. Um, ice was used to visualize the clot in transit, and that is, you can see in image A, the clot from the right atrium into um, the left atrium um, across the PFO. It's a pretty sub substantial um, clot size. And then in figure B, um, you can see it cross um, the tricuspid valve as well. And um, like I said, angiobac thrombectomy was performed with ice for successful aspiration of the intact thrombus. And you can see in figure C, the thrombus is now successfully gone. Um, and then for completeness sake, in figure D, you can see that the PFO was su su successfully closed as well. And this was the actual clot that was aspirated. Um, so 16 centimeters. Um, and you can see in the, air, the arrow is where the transition point where it crossed the PFO. So obviously the darker on the top um, was in the right side and then the left is where it crossed into the left atrium through the PFO. So conclusions, um, clot and transit is obviously a medical emergency and can have debilitating consequences. Um, I can't imagine if that 16 centimeter clot had um, left her uh, atrium. Um, patients with multiple comorbidities, such as this lady, um, have a lot of surgical risk, and most surgeons, I don't think, would feel safe taking her to the operating room. So there's not really a lot of options for these kinds of cases. Um, we propose using angiovac in these high-risk cases. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, any comments or questions? So did you guys use any uh, cerebral protection during this case? No, not that I'm aware of. Only for the sake that, again, your point of left atrial migration, you know, obviously when you're manipulating and sucking clot, you don't know how it's going to respond. Uh, would you guys on the panel, would you guys suggest using cerebral protection if you're doing this? Yeah, I, I thought about that. I mean, I don't do any angiovac and I don't do any pert, pert work, but I just don't know how often angiovac, as you're actually, you know, vacuuming, uh, how, many, how many times clot may break off and, and 
therefore, because you're fortunate you have 16 centimeters sticking in the right side, but all of a sudden as you're aspirating aspirin, if it breaks off, there's really not much tethering it down anymore. And if it could potentially yeah. have a paradoxical embolus as a result of that, but again, I'm, I'm certainly, you're more of an expert in it than I am, so I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I like uh, like Gug and I have never angiovac anything in my life, but uh, I have um, done my fair share of sentinel devices and uh, really, I mean, maybe five to seven minutes total to place a sentinel through the radial artery. Um, I, I don't, you know, if I were to do something like this, I certainly wouldn't hesitate to place that, although uh, you're, you're getting only two-thirds coverage, but that's better than zero. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a very valid point. What are your thoughts about the, the PFO closure right on the table was kind of an interesting decision. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, involved in that discussion or decision making? I, I will be honest, that was more of the attending oh, level. Yeah. Um, I think the concern was if she were to have to stay off blood thinners mm -hmm. just due to that hematoma and all of our other risk factors, while she was there it was just worth it to go ahead and close. Yeah. No, I think it's the right decision. You think about reimbursement and guidelines and, you know, and, and on a case like that and sometimes you just have to do it. So it's uh, it's kind of an interesting thought process. What was your post-procedural anticoagulation regimen? So we did restart her homopixaban. Um, and she stayed in the CCU or like for about a night or two um, and then went to the floor, was watched, um, and went to rehab and actually has done very, very well. I think you could make an argument for switching. Uh, the DOAC, right? Because she was on a pixel. She wasn't on it. Oh, she was not. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. She it was, was off yeah, It had been held for Excuse about a me. month. Yeah. Yeah. Just didn't know with the with the PFO closure device, would you also put an antiplatelet? We did not. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I I rarely do PFO closures in someone who is on an oral anticoagulant because most of the patients I do it on have had cryptogenic strokes, and I put them on six months of DAPT. But I I would imagine that you probably could just get away with the DOAC. Yeah. So John Carroll has a series of patients that he's done PFO closure on. And he's published on it, and, and these were a series of patients that had hypercoagulable disorder, and either due to interruption or breakthrough, they had paradoxical events. So he ended up closing them, and he just continued them on either vitamin K or DOAX, and they did just fine. So antiplatelet is not uh, absolutely necessary for for his series, at least. And you know, the, one of the other points here is if you do have someone who's hypercoagulable and you're putting a PFO device in, if they ever interrupt their anticoagulation, theoretically, are you going to develop clot on the PFO device? No. And so there's, I don't know if that's the perfect answer to put a device in on table, probably sucking the clot, absolutely, but I'm not sure the device is the definitive answer. Cool. Any other comments from the audience? All right. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Brown. Thank you. All right, and so uh, next we have uh, Dr. Chug. I was hoping Rahul would present this one because it's a really long title. So transcatheter pulmonary and tricuspid valve and valve implantation to treat sequential stenotic lesions in a septuagenarian with tetralogy of Fallot. Okay, I got through it. Sorry about the long title. Was that, no, that's good, as long as I just didn't want to make, make a fool of myself. I got it. it happens a lot. I think this is the, the wrong. They should be there. They are. If you search by my name, they should be there. Well, we could move on to this sure. one while they. Sure. Would you guys want us to do that? Just move on to this one, or yeah. So they've got a. So this one is uh, Dr. Derbas. Okay. Management of severe mitral regurgitation after failed surgical mitral valve repair. I was just on a panel with Steve Bowling, and so he would argue that he, there's no such thing as a failed surgical mitral valve repair, but I'll this is you, the one case. I'll let you argue that. Good <laughs> afternoon. Uh, my name is Leith Derbas. I'm a general fellow, a cardiology fellow at Rush uh, Hospital. I'll be presenting this structural case from Rush University. So our patient is a 72-year-old female who presented to the clinic complaining of shortness of breath with minimal exertion. She had uh, multiple hospitalizations related to decompensated heart failure. She has history of CAD cabbage in 2008. She also had another open heart surgery for a mitral valve regurgitation status post aneuplasty ring in 2010. Her EF is 30 to 35 percent. She has an ICD RV dysfunction, history of lung cancer, status post radiation to the chest, uh, AFib, diabetes, CKD, uh, chronic thrombocytopenia. Her TEE, I'll show you the images, uh, but showed mal malcoaptation of the valve leaflets 
severe MR and uh, concern for mitral valve ring dehiscence. Uh, how, so we got a CT to further evaluate the mitral valve ring, and it showed that uh, there was a complete ring that was visualized around 15 millimeter above the mitral valve plane without any rock rocking motion. So this is the transesophageal echocardiogram uh, four-chamber view. As you can see, the uh, ring is located above the mitral valve annulus. The uh, mitral valve leaflets are malcoapting. There is a central jet uh, that was estimated to be severe based on the color Doppler. Here's the 3D image showing, uh, again, large jet central, and another smaller one that was lo looking like as if it's coming from the peripheral side, but we felt that the majority of the regurgitation was all central. This is the mean gradient, uh, was four millimercury. The mitral valve area was estimated to be two centimeters squared. So we have a patient who has several comorbidities. Her STS score was 15%. NYJ class three, multiple hospitalizations for heart failure. Uh, mitral valve area was two, mean gradient was four. Flail gap and flail width were within you know, range for a consideration of a transcath to edge, to edge repair. So what would we do, what would we do next? Um, would we refer for a third op uh, operation, third sternotomy, consideration of a clip procedure or placing a valve in ring. Clearly the surgeons deemed this patient as a high candidate, high risk uh, candidate for a third operation, so uh, that option was no longer an option. Uh, placing a valve in ring was also not a great idea given the position of that ring and concern for dehiscence. And uh, we were just left with this last option to consider a clip in this patient as a last resort for her symptoms. Again, based on the CT, we felt that the ring was not dehisced. It's just more like a, um, a ring that was sutured in a way above the annular plane, like as if it's HL plication, so to speak. Um, but uh, it's failed and it's not sure doing its uh, result, uh, what it needs to do. So we proceeded with a trans uh, with a transcatheter edge to edge repair, and we used an eight French sheet for the right femoral vein. Uh, transeptal puncture was carried out use, uh, using the RF needle in the usual fashion under fluoroscopy and TE guidance. Uh, right femoral venous axis site was dilated sequentially and we used the 24 French steerable guide catheter that was placed in the left atrium. These are the measurements that we obtained in the procedure. The posterior leaflet was 10 millimeter in length. The height of the transeptal puncture was 5.3 centimeters. Uh, we used an NTW mitral clip delivery system that was advanced with a great care and moderate difficulty through the ring and um, under 3D guidance. With the clip arms were carefully opened at 120 degrees and the A2P2 segments were captured without difficulty. Here's more images showing the position before deployment. And these are the images showing post mitral clip deployment where the uh, the MR severity was reduced significantly from severe to, I would say, mild to moderate based on these images. This is another image showing uh, 3D uh, micro, uh, the regurgitation post-clip deployment. And the mean gradient before was four, after was three millimercury. And these are the left atrial pressure hemodynamics. Uh, mean LA pressure was decreased from 31 to 27. The V wave was decreased from 64 to 46. Uh, Follow-up echo the next day showed that the mitral regurgitation severity was decreased to mild to moderate. The mean diastolic gradient was three, and the patient was seen on follow-up after three months, uh, stating that her symptoms have improved significantly and did not require any further hospitalizations for the next three months. So in conclusion, mitral clip is a safe and less invasive treatment option for patients with recurrent MR after a failed surgical mitral valve repair. Long-term outcomes for such procedures are to be established. Uh, additional imaging, such as using different angles on TEE, transgastric views, and eyes can facilitate leaflet grasping and shorten the de device uh, time by dealing with technical challenges and cause uh, caused by the shadowing from the annuloplasty ring. Thank you. So, uh, I mean, if you can go back to that picture um, where you deployed the clip and you had the annuloplasty ring, it was a fluoro image. I don't know how easily you can go back. But this is a perfect example of why annuloplasty in functional mitral regurgitation does not work. Um, and there are some sites out there. So, yeah, that picture right there. So if you look at where the annular ring or the ring is placed, 
and you look at where your did your edge to edge repair, I mean, it's almost a good centimeter and a half below. So the coaptation point is about a centimeter and a half below the, the actual annular plane, which is where they put the annular ring. And perhaps they were a little bit atrial, but even if they were truly on the true native annulus, and this is why surgeons still continue to do annuloplasty for functional mitral regurgitation. And it sounds like this was an isolated mitral annuloplasty yep. for functional mitral regurgitation. And, and unfortunately, these are the adverse outcomes that you're left to deal with because it's not in the same plane. And the same reason is why indirect annuloplasty is probably not a good long-term solution either. So it's a great picture to illustrate the anatomy where the, the annulus is relative to where the coaptation plane is. It's often in functional mitral regurgitation far below where the, the level of the annulus is. So. So I just want to say you stole my thunder because I'll be presenting this exact case later on this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> but I will tell you, though, it's a perfect example of why you can perform tear or a clip placement in these types of situations. The dehiscence, the gap that's there, it's interesting how it doesn't actually contribute to the severe MR. It's really through the valve itself. And uh, it's quite fascinating that you can have a patient that has potentially dehiscence and not have clinical sequelae from it as long as the central MR is taken care of. So a great case, obviously, and I'm glad that she's doing well after three months. So you brought up the questions about imaging. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, your transesophageal echo probe is behind, you know, the, the esophagus, and you're penetrating through this, this annual plasty ring to, to get a sense of leaflet insertion. And, and again, I'm, I'm pretty sure your attendings had a qu pretty challenging time with the imaging for a leaflet insertion. So I don't know, Lucy, any tips or tricks on, on how to image these, um, you know, these types of tier procedures? Yeah, certainly challenging for sure. Are you able to play the image on the left again? That would be great if you could. Yeah, I'll go back and then go forward. Yeah, so, so here the annular plasty ring is more atrial than, you know, the native annula. So what they're doing is they're clipping the native leaflets. Okay. Um, essentially ignoring the, the ring that is present but not doing much anymore. I wonder if this patient ended up having some sort of tethering or pulling of those leaflets because, like mentioned previously, the coaptation plane is much more ventricular than I would have expected. So I wonder if there was some sort of um, ischemic insult or something that caused the mitral valve leaflets to be so low, and then essentially they're just doing a mitral clip. Now here it's hard because Part of the procedure, for those of you that do mitral clip procedures, is orientation. And so you need to orient the clip perpendicular to the leaflet coaptation plane. And if you can't see the leaflet coaptation plane, it's going to be hard. This is where glass view comes into view, uh, play. So this looks like it's a Phillips machine. So putting on glass view and where you can change the tissue transparency to glass-like and see through that annulus would be helpful. Um, so that, that would be probably my major trick here in order to help improve your imaging and uh, line up the clip. Cool, glass view, I'm gonna remember that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why having someone knows TE <laughs> is so imperative during my triple cases. Yeah. Just a, another comment, uh, those are all excellent remarks by everyone. Uh, I had a case last week of um, posterior, it was a complete ring, and the posterior part of the ring had completely dehissed from the posterior annulus. The patient was referred for a mitral clip, and I had to repeat the TEE just to get some dedicated images of what we were going to look at. And there was no posterior leaflet to speak of, because when that patient had his mitral repair surgery, it was for primary degenerative mitral regurgitation and issues with uh, posterior leaflet, uh, which I, I imagine had been resected or excised in some way surgically. So obviously, uh, for those in the audience, uh, not all of these cases, uh, you know, of course, can be clipped. And valve and ring, uh, which is currently a commercially available therapy, is another option for cases where you think the ring is not dehissed, but there is some valvular leaflet issue, whether it be stenosis or regurgitation. But in a case of a dehissed or partially or fully dehissed ring, uh, you know, you're limited to either redo surgery um, for most cases or in some scenarios palliative care if there are no transcatheter options. But this is a great example to Dr. Um, Singh and Dr. Shafee's points on, um, on how mitral clip can be effective in this type of phenotype of uh, mitral regurgitation from secondary MR. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, your turn. Now you do it. All right, so we're going to have a case presentation by Dr. Uh, Deshavi Shug. 
pretty good. Okay. Uh, on transcatheter pulmonary and tricuspid valve and ring implantation to treat sequential stenotic lesions in a septuagenarian with tetralogy of fallow. <sighs> I'm trying to see if you can do it in one, <laughs> in one breath. That's the goal. Um, so I, I did this. Um, I, I had the privilege of being a part of this case during my structural fellowship um, just a couple of months ago. Um, so there was, this is a 77-year-old male uh, who had tetralogy of fallows, and um, he was admitted uh, to our center with predominantly right heart failure symptoms. Um, he, he has an extensive surgical history like most of these patients. So he had a BT shunt in the 40s. Uh, a complete repair for TOF in the 60s, and then had redo sternotomy for redo VSD repair uh, in the 60s as well. And then in 2017, uh, for severe TR, he underwent a 33-millimeter 33, 33 epic valve placement. Um, unfortunately, this time he uh, developed a severe sternal wound infection, and his entire sternum had to be resected. Um, he is on diuretic therapy at home. He was on um, anticoagulation for AFib, um, significantly volume overloaded, predominantly right heart failure um, symptoms and signs on exam. And uh, his labs, as you can see, were remarkable for anemia and, and, and AKI. He had a right bundle and AFib, as I mentioned. So uh, first echo after his admission, he was found to have a, a dysfunctional RV. Um, a relatively normal uh, left ventricle, uh, and both his uh, tricuspid and pulmonic valves were in trouble. Um, so uh, image on the upper left is the bioprosthetic uh, tricuspid valve, which had a mean gradient of 8 at a heart rate of 68. And then uh, you can sort of see this thick dysplastic pulmonic valve leaflets, a little bit hard to capture since it's a transthoracic echo, and the gradient was almost 60 uh, over here. Um, so he had, was in essentially profound right heart failure. He was managed um, in the intensive care unit. Uh, he had a right heart cath with normal left-sided pressures, but his RA and RB pressures were tremendously high. Um, we couldn't do a CT. We did do an MRI. Uh, this confirmed um, a, a dysfunctional RV and sort of reconfirmed this, this stenotic and dysplastic pulmonary valve leaflets uh, that, uh, that he had. Um, so he was, you know, at this point, he's in his 70s, profound RV failure on diuretics, inotropes. Uh, he's had four sternotomies. He was essentially prohibitive risk for redo surgery, so we opted for uh, transcatheter route. So our plan going in was he uh, comes, in, comes to the lab, GA, uh, TEE guidance, and and perhaps we'll balloon size uh, for the transcatheter valve in the pulmonic position, and then we'll do a valve and valve in the tricuspid position based on um, the valve and valve app, which, which came out to a 29 sapien. So uh, procedure day, as I said, GATE. Uh, we started off with a cut pigtail um, over a stiff wire in the PA, did an angiogram, and a second image essentially shows calcification at the pulmonic valve post stenotic dilation. We performed balloon angioplasty. We took the pigtail out, performed um, angioplasty using a 30 by 40 PTSX balloon. And then following this, we did successive um, sort of serial uh, balloon inflations with various sized non-compliant balloons. We went up to a 24 balloon. And as you can see, the waist size was around 23. Um, also, we performed a non-selective um, angiography of the aortic root to make sure the coronaries weren't being compromised um, uh, during a, a a balloon inflation. Um, so as the sort of waste gave away at uh, the use of a 24 millimeter atlas gold, we decided uh, to, to go ahead with a 26 um, sapien um, in, in that position. Um, so this was our deployment. We swapped our 12 French dry seal for a long um, 65, 26 French dry seal. And using biplane angiography, we uh, basically positioned and uh, deployed this 26 S3 Ultra at nominal inflation. Um, we then came back, had the same wire across, came back and did valve and valve with the 29 S3. Um, as you can see, it was a little hard to get coaxial to the to the failing tricuspid valve, but uh, we were ultimately able to do that, and uh, we we had a pretty good uh, deployment. And I can perhaps we can wait a few seconds and just see the deployment. It's 
anyway, sorry, this was the final deployment. Um, so he did pretty well. He was home uh, at seven days, transitioned uh, to PO diuretics, renal function recovered. Six month follow up, doing much better. His RV is still dysfunctional. Uh, his gradient on the tri new tricuspid valve and valve position was four, and his peak gradient across the pulmonary valve was 30. Um, he also had CT uh, on follow up. So he was noted to have halt and ham on two of the three leaflets, as you can see on the first image on the left. Um, so we increased his INR from a goal of 2 to 3 to 2.5 to 3.5, and he also had uh, the, the, the sapien valve in the pulmonic position um, in image 2 and 3 uh, was functioning uh, pretty well. Um, so to our knowledge, actually, this was the oldest um, reported case of an old patient who had a double valve in such a scenario, so we ended up publishing this as well. Thank you so much. I don't do any congenital work, so you're you're the expert here. Um, how do you decide, you know, when, especially when you have that waste in the pulmonic position? So our congenital, um, we have a pediatric congenital guy. He actually talks about putting in a, a like a frame, like a stent first, and then doing serial dilatations in case there is some sort of rupture. Yeah. And so that way you can immediately go in and, and put in a sapien valve. Uh, is there any concern for? Is that like just are they just overhyped or? Is there a concern for that at all, and how do you mitigate that? Yeah, no, for sure. I think in my in my one year of fellowship, we did around 15 cases, and a majority of them had enough calcium there to anchor. And I, I think the school of thought is split between putting a sort of a covered stent and then anchoring on that versus having enough calcium in the RVOT and just using that to anchor. So, you know, we have been doing it just, you know, for native PS, we've just been going ahead and putting in um, valves without putting in a covered stent beforehand. Okay. But yes, there, there's definitely a risk that we, we cannot mitigate. Yeah. Great case. A um, couple questions. Uh, usually the stents, as mentioned, are done in conduits, uh, but you decided to do it in the native pulmonic valve. Um, first question is, you know, why did you choose a sapien over a melody uh, valve? And then um, follow-up question on the tricuspid side, uh, did you need to RV pace or did you deploy it without pacing? Yeah, no, great. Thank you so much for those questions. So um, in terms of pacing, uh, we've had pretty good experience without needing to pace on the right side at least for both the tricuspid and pulmonic valves. Um, and then in terms of the melody valve, um, I guess two comments. One, at that time we didn't have access to it, unfortunately. We just had the sapien valve. And then uh, the mechanism of failure was predominantly stenosis and not regurg. So I'm not sure if the melody valve in, in those circumstances um, you, you know, would be, uh, could be used. And uh, how about measurement of the neo RBOT when you were measuring the leaflet lengths? Was there any concern at all, given that it was obviously a biprosthetic that was there prior, but how do you cut, what's your cutoff usually? Because we obviously, on the left side, are always so concerned with the neo LBOT. How about when you're doing this type of procedure? So, you know, to be honest, uh, I don't think we look at the neo RBOT as much, at least when you're doing a valve in valve. Um, yeah, so but I, I think definitely something to think about down the road. Yeah, that's a good question. I've probably done about a dozen valve and valves, and I, I haven't thought about uh, RVOT a single time. I think the way it's oriented is just in a totally different, uh, uh, different way. So, but the deployment is pretty typical for how we do it too, which is very, very slow, uh, and there's no rapid pacing needed. It's a much lower pressure system, and then you just and you can see it on your deployment. Very micro adjustments, uh, a little bit of ventricular, a little bit of atrial, uh, push on the wire a little bit. That'll straighten it up, or pull on the wire. Uh, but that was kind of a textbook deployment on the tricuspid, at least. And do you have any comments on neck axis versus groin? You know, I, I've I've done neck axis for a mitra clip once, um, and and that was in a patient with an occluded IVC. For all other things, we usually just go from the groin. Ergonomically, it's just a lot easier. The way the rooms are set up is a lot easier. There are some new transcatheter or tricuspid valve technologies that are developing stuff from the neck, but they are developing special stands that attach to the patient's bed. But you have to remove the room around and all that stuff. So ergonomically it is. So if you can do it from the groin, it's, it's preferable. Uh, I haven't done one from the neck. I don't know if any of you guys. How about you? Have you done any from the neck? We did one tricuspid. Yeah. It seemed like more work. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the groin worked equally Same fine. Same thing, yeah. yeah. You can definitely get, I mean, if you have a safari, uh, in the right ventricle, because you guys had a wire up in the pulmonary artery. Yeah. But if you have a safari in the right ventricle, you can often always get coaxial with very, very, very slow deployment. For sure. It'll get there. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Good case.
All right, so next we have uh, Dr. Karan Gupta who's going to be talking to us about redo tier in the setting of iatrogenic ASD closure. All right, well, thanks for having me today. Uh, Dr. Singh is probably a little familiar to you because I think you published something similar to this a couple years back. All right, so today's case, I'm going to be talking about a redo tier in the setting of an nitrogen ASD closure. Uh, I also happened to be an interventional fellow at the time, and my attending is Dr. Marco Ciardi, and we did this at uh, Evanston, Evanston Hospital uh, at the North Shore Health System. He sent me a message. He told me to ask you some really tough questions. He did. Oh, good. That's good. <laughs> All right, so I have no disclosures. All right, so uh, just the case presentation. This is a 73-year-old male. Uh, he was referred to us uh, in our structural clinic uh, for severe symptomatic uh, mitral regurgitation. Uh, functionally, his signs and symptoms are a class three, uh, New York Hospital Association. Um, of note, 17 months prior to presentation in our clinic, he actually underwent a successful mitral tear uh, for a primary MR due to um, healed endocarditis. Uh, he had next CW placed at the central A2P2 position uh, with one plus residual MR, and he also underwent a percutaneous ASD device closure uh, using a 25 millimeter uh, gore cribriform uh, for severe bidirectional uh, shunting. Uh, the other uh, medical history is listed on the right, and for time's sake, I'm just going to move on. All right, uh, so this is the preoperative TE. This was done uh, about a week after he saw us in clinic. This was not done um, post-op of the first uh, mitral tear. So as you can see here, uh, there is a new uh, P1 flail uh, slash cord rupture that we see, as well as uh, a well-seated XTW at the A2P2 position. Um, he's got this severe eccentric MR uh, with an EROA of uh, 0.57, uh, PISA of 1.1, and a recursionative volume of approximately 84. Um, the patient does have a mean mitral grade of approximately 5 at a heart rate of 71, and um, there was no color flow, and it's a well-opposed 25-millimeter gore device. And just some different pictures. Um, I know I probably should have got a BICOM, a better BICOM view, but I just wanted to at least so you can at least see the pathology and uh, see the well-seated device. And the, three, the panel on the right is a 3D image, and uh, on the left side of that right panel is your atrial perspective, and then from the ventricular perspective for those who aren't familiar. All right, those are just some hemodynamics. Um, so I'll move on. Um, so we did a 3D MPR uh, derived uh, planimeter area of the mitral valve, uh, given that it was a double outlet valve from the prior M uh, tier, and it was approximately, um, I think it was, what is it, 4.9, I think it was 4.91 uh, was what we got as the uh, total mitral uh, valve area. And uh, from the top of the device, uh, the height was approximately 4.5 uh, centimeters, so. So um, <clears throat> the patient, you know, we did have a heart team approach for both cases, and after the first case, the patient had, was adamantly uh, refusing um, open heart surgery, so that's why we elected to proceed with the uh, transcatheter tier at that time. And ultimately, after another uh, heart team discussion, we, the, the, the decision was made to proceed with a redo tier. Um, however, at this time, uh, you know, one of the technical challenges that, you know, is present in this case is that the transeptal puncture and traversal is going to be challenging, and uh, whether we do it through or around the um, existing occluder was uh, something that we, you know, had to deliberate prior to proceeding. Oh, well, I had another picture. I guess this was a different slide than what I had sent over, but uh, I had a panel on the right. Uh, the, my, I had uh, two panels. One the panel on the left was supposed to be a TE image um, that we had. The imaging was quite suboptimal compared to our normal um, tiers, but uh, essentially the decision was that we didn't really have much room uh, for a favorable delivery of the clip because we had, you know, potential interaction with atrial uh, tissue or anatomy if we were to go slightly posterior or around uh, the device. So we decided to basically go where the previous area of success was for the last year. So that was through the actual um, ASD occluder. Um, we used a, we typically will use a, a, a SL1 with a BRK needle and electrocautery uh, in order to uh, trans, uh, to get transeptal puncture and access, but for this case, given the fact that we had a very, uh, you, we had an area that we were going to try to attack, we preferentially used a 8.5 French Agila steerable catheter, as well as a denuded front end of a 0.014 Ostato 20 guide wire. So um, essentially, we were able to get the um, Ostato wire wrapped basically around the uh, left atrium to get an adequate purchase. And we performed serial septostomy initially with a 30.014 uh, coronary wire, I mean, coronary balloon, and uh, increased to about a 50. 
and even up to a 5.0 balloon, as you can see on the panel on the right, uh, we were unable to traverse the dilator across uh, the, left, the, right, the left atrial disc. So what we did in this step after this was we actually um, kept the uh, sheath and the dilator in that same position and we removed the Estado wire and we exchanged it for an uh, AES uh, 0.035 uh, guide wire this time. And then uh, we decided to just go big at this point and so we decided to use a 80 by 40 uh, Evercross uh, over the wire uh, 035 compatible balloon. Uh, we went up to nominal atmospheres, which was around, I think was around 10 or 12. And uh, as you can see here, there's quite a bit of uh, waste in the initial inflation, but um, we kept the balloon inflated for a little bit, and as you can see, that waste is eliminated, which we um, believe that it might have been the intraatrial septum at that point. So as you can see on the panel on the right, we were able to get the, um, the Agilis um, catheter across into the, uh, into the uh, what's it called, the left atrium. And upon doing this, then we were able to sort of uh, twerk, uh, you know, to rotate the catheter in a way to preferentially get our 035 wire in the left upper pulmonary vein. So then uh, we removed the steerable catheter and then brought in our um, you know, clip uh, uh, steerable guide catheter, uh, the 22 French. And as you can see here uh, on the left panel, we struggled again <laughs> quite a bit. And so um, we, have, we then uh, basically took out the um, dilator from the steerable guide catheter and then we actually went up with a 90 by 40 um, Mustang balloon and uh, went up to nominal inflations. We inflated it, tried inserting it, didn't go again. So then what we ended up doing was keeping it inflated and uh, basically just pushed through and uh, clenched a little bit, to be honest. And luckily, uh, everything went okay. And immediately, as you can see here, one thing that was a little bit of a dangerous sign at that point was that, you know, your balloon is definitely going into the pulmonary vein. So I immediately went off on the balloon, deflated the balloon immediately as you saw that. But uh, uh, another thing to note also is you can see how much tension is on that uh, left atrial disc, but then immediately it uh, uh, goes to show the engineering behind that device is quite great. So, The rest of the procedure was relatively unremarkable at that point. Um, I did forget to also add another thing that the height, uh, we actually uh, measured a height uh, of our steerable guide catheter relative to the mitral uh, valve annulus and we got a height of approximately 4.15 uh, centimeters, so we had good heights at this time. Um, we decided to put two clips. The first clip was an NTW that we placed slightly lateral um, to the XC, initial XTW at the A2P2 position. And uh, you can sort of see that on our uh, 3D image on the left. And then um, this was just a grasping view uh, that we were able to grasp on the, um, I'm not sure if you can see the grippers coming down on that, but. So the, the panel on the left is a fluoroscopic image of what it looks like when we actually release the mitral clip. And as you can see, with its orientation relative to the first, it's slightly lateral to it. And then as you can see here, even though we went from, we went from about four to five plus to about three to four plus. So we had a mild, you know, mild improvement, but obviously we weren't too happy at this point. And uh, the initial mean gradient was approximately five. And uh, as you can see here, there's not much of a change as well in the mean mitral gradient. So the second clip that we placed was actually even more lateral to the initial, NT, uh, the second and the you know, NTW clip, and we positioned it at the A1P1 position, and uh, that was relatively uncomplicated. And as you can see here, um, you know, quite a good, quite a good result um, with a near abolishment of that mitral <coughs> vegetation. And the panel on the right is just another image of the um, intraatrial, um, intraatrial septal uh, occluder. And as you can see here, it's a unidire unidirectional shunt, and it's really not significant in, uh, in its uh, magnitude. So we just let it be for then, uh, and just let it be, and just we're going to treat it conservatively and just uh, expect it to observe it. Um, and the mean mitral gradient was uh, approximately 5 millimeters, and that was at a heart rate of uh, 73 and a blood pressure of 129 or 50. And uh, we actually, <clears throat> normally we would just, uh, you know, pull, uh, you know, pull everything out. But because of the fact that we went through this core device, and in the event that we had to do any type of further, um, you know, plugging of this hole of the initial um, hole that we placed, that we, you know, had in, we put an 035 wire. We're able to get into the left upper pulmonary vein, and uh, I don't know why it's not playing, but yeah, uncomplicated. And as you can see here, the device was intact. 
So just some hemodynamics, the initial mean, um, LA was up around 34. After the first clip, it decreased to 27. And after the second clip, it went down to 12 with a pretty significant reduction in the V wave as well. And the systolic blood pressure also improved by about 28 millimeters of mercury from start to post. So on the post-procedure day one, we typically, so we typically get an echo post-procedure day one as well as 30-day post, and um, it did show an intact septal occluder with no residual shunt. It did show 2 plus MR, uh, mean mitral gradient of approximately 5, and uh, relatively unchanged findings from the periop TE. So just some final thoughts. <clears throat> so obviously prior transcatheter ASD closure, it you know, used to be very feared, but it doesn't preclude transeptal access for redo mitral tear. Um, we, you know, traversal with an energized 014 wire and balloon assisted tracking of the steerable guide sheath as described here is just one method that can be utilized. Um, I know Dr. Singh, you had uh, done two with a mitral clip as well as a watchman device that I think for the mitral clip you actually were able to go around uh, the device at that time. And then for cases where an iatrogenic AC closure is performed, um, you know, maybe we should have careful consideration uh, with respect to what type of device we're using for our uh, repeat transeptal access. Great. Great case. So, um, so I would just say that, I mean, this is, it's an amazing case, and hats off to, to you and Mark um, for kind of diligently sticking with it. Um, and, and you're right, I think um, for patients who have an iatrogenic ASD and it needs to be closed. Uh, the thought process should be, should we use a Gore device versus uh, the crib form? I think there was a little bit of a mis uh, typo on your first slide where you said it was a crib device. That's, so a crib form device is a lot more nitinol. And in the case series that we published, it was the crib form device. That device to get through it and to make the holes bigger and bigger and bigger, to do what you guys did probably would have taken all day to make the hole big enough to be able to finally get a steerable guide catheter across. So if you are gonna close an nitrogen ASD and there is concern that you might have to go back in the future for whatever reason, using a Gore device is, yep. is definitely, I would say, advised. There is a lot of healthcare dollars being spent. There's at least five companies in the Bay Area that I know of that are working on an iatrogenic ASD device that will allow for reaccess in the future, uh, whether it's for LAO, whether it's for ablation, or whether it's mm -hmm. for, for mitral therapies. Uh, so there's a lot of interest interest in this field right now. I have one quick question, and I'll kind of pass it off, which mm -hmm. is, why do you think, and I don't know the answer to this, why do you think the patient had bidirectional shunting after the first case, but then only had left to right on the second case? And so you didn't, then it required you not to close the second hole that you made. Well, yeah, that is a good question. And I think maybe that the, um, you know, maybe that the direction of transeptal puncture was slightly, and there was some uh, cloth, the, the, what's it called, the, um, the fabric off the, the door. fabric off maybe the fabric you know was a little bit of I think also another thing was that it may have been eccentric puncture as well because if you look how the you know the tram was going it was going in one direction and the other so I think it could be eccentric coverage or whatever was left of the you know cloth which is what Got it. I think was the reason that you know we didn't have a significant okay. shift. So I've I've done a handful of these through a Gore device mm -hmm. and I have never had to do the yeoman's work that you and uh, Mark <laughs> had to do to get through this. I've never done it through uh, the Amplatzer device. Um, but to Goggin's point, I always close uh, my intraatrial uh, iatrogenic septal defects after a TMVR procedure, meaning mitral valve replacement, not after tear. That's just because how, how I was trained. Uh, yet after mitral clip, we rarely ever close it. But uh, that's, a, that's a whole other uh, controversial issue. But the point I was going to make is that I think what happened here is that when you crossed, mm. I think you just alluded to this, it went through the nitinol tines of the Gore device because the, the, the Dacron material that's between the nitinol rings is more than ample space to get, you know, an 18 or 20 French system through there or 16 French. I can't remember the size, but that was just incredible work that you guys had to do. And... Uh, uh, and, and a fantastic result to boot. What do you usually use to, to go transeptal? Do you use RF? I, 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 I've always used Bayless, and now yeah. more recently the Bayless versus across. Okay. Yeah. Even across these, uh, the yeah. core devices? Yeah, I've never, never had an issue. So quick question. Uh, we talked about the heart, but wasn't there a mention of an IVC filter in this patient, or was that removed before that was you removed, went in? Sorry. It was Got also it. removed subsequently. I forgot to Because I think that's another thing because I've, you know, you guys have done as well, but, you know, there's certain filters you can go through and certain ones you yeah. end up taking with you. Yes. So. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Great case. 
Um, so another um, case coming up here with uh, by presented by Austin Harris on an innovative ECMO configuration for refractory hypoxemia in COVID-19 induced ARDS. Hi everybody. Uh, my name is Austin. I'm a third year medicine resident at the University of Kentucky. And I'll be talking with you about um, an approach we use to ECMO in a few patients that had refractory hypoxia and COVID despite traditional ECMO cannulation. So just a little background before we start, as I'm sure everybody knows, the, the incidence of ARDS in the setting of COVID has gone up a lot. And at our institution, I know that we've had more um, use of VV ECMO for this for this, these patients with severe ARDS and refractory hypoxia with traditional management. As you guys know, there's limited options for these patients with severe ARDS. Um, you can do pronings, steroids, paralysis, there's some ventilator strategies, and then VV ECMO. But the evidence about the mortality benefits with VV ECMO is limited. Um, there was the CSER trial that showed some benefit in mortality at six months when they compared ECMO to patients in the conventional arm. Um, there's also some limitations to ECMO in and of itself in these patients. They can have shunting, um, states physiologic or super physiologic cardiac output states, as well as recirculation, recirculation, recirculation sorry, that can lead to um, hypoxia despite VV ECMO support. So to our case, so these are the first two patients that we've did this on at our institution. So they were two patients that were admitted to the ICU at the University of Kentucky for um, COVID-19, they were intubated, had refractory hypoxia um, despite conventional therapy, and eventually the decision was made to cannulate them for VV ECMO with the traditional strategy, which at our institution usually involves the placement of a 23 to 31 French drainage, cal uh, drainage cannula via the right femoral vein, and then a return cannula that's usually between 15 to 19 French um, via the internal jugular vein. So that's what these patients got and both remained hypoxemic despite uh, maximal ECMO support. So the question was, what do we do now? So this is a dilemma that we occasionally will run into, and there's not a whole lot of guidance on what the next best step is. There's some papers that talk about repositioning of some of the cannulas, how you can adjust the position of the return cannula to maybe try and reduce some recirculization phenomenon um, and improve oxygenation, but there's no definitive steps. So what we did, um, there's been new usage of left atrial VA ECMO, um, and that's kind of what we use as our inspiration. So in uh, left atrial VA ECMO, the drainage cannula is actually placed in the left atrium to facilitate LV unloading in the setting of cardiogenic shock. So that's kind of the idea we used behind our approach. So we placed our return cannula, or our drainage cannula, pardon me, in the left femoral vein, it was the standard size, which again was 21 to 31 French at our institution, um, and placed that at the cable atrial junction, and then via the right femoral vein, gained venous access up into the right atrium. We used intra, uh, intracardiac echo guidance to perform a transeptal puncture, which allowed us to have left atrial access. We then inserted a catheter into the pulmonary vein um, to monitor our pressures during the procedure. And once we ensured our pressures were as close to physiologic as we could get in these patients, we swapped the cannula out for, uh, the catheter, sorry, out for a 19 French biomedicus cannula, which was placed in the left atrium. We again checked our pressures, and when they were physiologic, we were, when they, we determined they were close to physiologic, we initiated the patients on the ECMO circuit. Um, in terms of results, so these, the first two patients that we did it on immediately had improvement in their oxygen saturations. They increased to greater than 96%. Um, they tolerated the procedure well, were sent back to the ICU, and unfortunately over the next few days had progression of their severe illness. They had multi-organ failure, progressive shock, and eventually the families decided to withdraw care and they unfortunately passed away. There have been additional patients who have had this same configuration done since the initial two, and I apologize, I don't know the exact number, but the additional patients have had better outcomes. They've been able to wean the ECMO circuit, decannulate the patients, and eventually discharge these patients. These patients have been seen in cardiology follow-up clinic uh, post-discharge and had echoes done six weeks post-procedure, which show um, healing of the transeptal puncture. So I think what our Two initial patients, as well as the additional patients that we've done this technique on show, is that this is a viable option for salvage therapy. 
Um, it's obviously not the first line treatment and your first starting point would obviously be VV ECMO, but if that's ineffective, that this could be an option to pursue in those patients. Thank you. Uh, that was excellent. Um, uh, I'm going to rely on your expertise here with a question I'm going to ask you. How, how is what you did uh, different from tandem heart via an ECMO circuit? Isn't that essentially what you did, tandem via ECMO? Um, I think so. I think that the only, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, because that, that's essentially what it is. Um, and, uh, and it can be effective and you know, cheer, you know, kudos to you guys for using it in these very sick patients and we're obviously still learning a lot more about COVID. Um, but, uh, but this, this is, uh, has been, uh, how do I say, this is something that has been argued by those who are in favor of this as being something that can be done in a cath lab setting fairly quickly um, in the experience centers that, that do this often and with the use of intracardiac echo for transeptal puncture. Um, years ago as a cardiology fellow, I would often cover these patients at night in the CCU and you would see that the change in color of the blood and the cannula from red to dark would indicate that the uh, tandem uh, cannula has fallen back from the left atrium into the right atrium. That's something we were always trained to watch for. And those patients were on a tandem heart circuit via ECMO, which is what uh, you guys have essentially done here. So uh, great case presentation, a lot of interesting hemodynamics um, in these types of patients, and uh, obviously they're very sick. All right, so uh, next we have Lawrence Hung, who's gonna talk about uh, post-infarction ventricular septal rupture after failed PCI. Yep, that's it, just press that green button. Gotcha. Hello, I'm, I'm Lawrence Wong, I'm, from, I'm a third year resident from Methodist Dallas Hospital, and I'm gonna talk about a case of post-infarction ventricular septal rupture after a failed PCI. Oh, the big ribbon, there you go. Okay. Just want to say no disclosures. So to the case, this is a 72-year-old male, past medical history of hypertension, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, who comes to the ER for three days of worsening shortness of breath and sky stage B, C shock. The interesting thing is, so he actually was from an outside hospital where he had a, del a four-day delayed presentation of an MI, unclear if it was NSTEMI or STEMI, um, but they found out his symptoms were two syncopal episodes at a Home Depot. He had a non-reperfusable infarct-related artery. They required pacemaker implantation for a complete heart block. And the TTE there showed no valvular abnormalities, no septal issues, EF of 50 to 55% with some akinetic segments, after, even, though, even though he stayed there for two weeks. And so this is some images from the cast they did at the outside hospital. Um, the first two sets is really just showing that in the interior circulation, including the circumflex, there wasn't really too much significant disease. And then the next set is on the right side of circulation. And we see that there's a thrombotic occlusion of his distal RCA. They attempted, I think, with the, they do a balloon angioplasty at first, uh, which you can kind of see on the right was the attempted angioplasty. And they had some partially successful results. So they had, a, you know, you can see some reperfusion of his posterior descending and posterior lateral artery branches. Um, but the distal RCA still wasn't reperfused, and then they tried doing thrombectomy, which also failed. So coming back to our case, so this is weeks later, he's here and he's in Sky B shock, and so these are some options we could have, right? We could retry to reperfuse, um, even though it's kind of failed before, we could try doing mechanical support. Um, but what we decided to do is we actually first did a echocardiogram which actually didn't show any defect. He had still had a similarly preserved ejection fraction and similarly just some the same wall motion abnormalities. And because of that, we decided to, go, we decided to chase this through with the right heart cath. And the main thing about the right heart cath is true, there are elevated RV pressures, PA pressures, but what I really want to point out is the V waves on the wedge pressure tracing and just how huge those are, which is kind of a tip, which you know, we normally would think of like mitral regurgitation. Um, but we follow this with a shunt run, and I think one first thing I want to notice is that the pulmonary artery saturation is actually really high compared to what we would see for a 
mitral regurge, and then that the shunt fraction was four. So we know there's some kind of shunt there, and this, and that's pretty large and would require some intervention. And so we decided to re redo his echo. And with the limited echo, we saw that you can see now we saw the VSD. And then we followed this with a bubble study, and we could see that there had simultaneous filling of the ventricles, which kind of confirmed what we were looking for. Um, so then we followed this by TEE. And the main thing I want to point out on these images is that you can see, you can actually kind of start to see the VSD uh, near the, but it's really close to the tricuspid annulus, and it's part of this pretty large basal aneurysm. Um, and, you know, just for a thoroughness sake, we did look at the mitral valve again, and there was no mitral regurg that was worth mentioning. Um, and on the right, we kind of see further this um, VSD, and we can kind of characterize it with the Doppler flow. Um, the second thing, this F image, I just want to show really is that there's, we actually saw there are two orifices to this VSD. So there's actually two different orifices. One was about 1.17, the other about 0.7 centimeters squared. And we did on power Doppler, on pulse wave Doppler, sorry, you can see that we actually found out that the peak gradient was about 41. And then we actually redid the sh kind of a shunt fraction on the echo and it was 1.9, so again, suggesting the shunt. So this kind of left us at a few management options. Um, ideally, surgical closure, right? Uh, with the data, we know that delayed closure tends to be better than immediate closure, even though guidelines do say to do immediate closure. Uh, medical therapy, frankly, just doesn't really work in these patients. Almost they will certainly die within 30 days if you try. Uh, we could do kind of temporary mechanical support. Um, another interesting one is there's a, is what's done in children, but there was a study done in China of using like permissive hypercapnia to try to increase the pulmonary vascular resistance to try to reduce the shunt. And then, of course, we could try transcatheter septal closure, but this depends on the location of the defect, tubular versus serpiginous tract, proximity to the valves, and tissue stability. So we attempted this uh, TSC because it was deemed high surgical risk given a shock state. Unfortunately, um, we did both approaches. We did anterograde and retrograde approaches. The problem with the interrogate approach is we couldn't wire the VSD, and the retrograde approach is the issues is we couldn't really, we didn't really want to go through the RV since he had the aneurysm, and then he also, in addition, he had these really fresh pacemaker wires placed in, so we were kind of stuck, and we just couldn't advance the wire to get to the VSD. So eventually what happened to do is we stabilized him in the, IC, in the CCU with mechanical support, inotropes. After about nine days, he got transferred to a different hospital. They did the surgical repair, and then he came back, and then it was stabilized and transferred back. So some kind of conclusions is that, you know, post-infarction ventricular septal rupture is a rare but highly fatal complication of myocardial infarction. I think one interesting part of our case is that this is a pretty delayed presentation of this happening. Normally, these can happen within a few days or a week or so, not like, three, not almost four weeks out. Um, Another thing is, is a very important differential to keep in mind when you do pulmonary capillary wedge tracings, when you see prominent V-waves, and it's not just mitral etiologies. Uh, surgical closure is the mainstay of treatment, and then that transseptal catheter rip closure is a viable option, but it depends on quite a few factors of anatomy and the characteristics of the defect. I'd like to, you know, acknowledgements, I'd like to thank CVI and the veterans and all the team involved in the case. What questions? So, um, uh, you know, I find post-infarct VSDs to be quite fascinating. They're so heterogeneous. And there is this thing that was invented a long time ago that if you can't pick it up on, on transthoracic echo, you can actually listen to the heart. And sometimes there's a murmur there, and, and that can point towards a VSD if you haven't made the diagnosis uh, with an echo and may not necessarily need a wedge catheter. But that's certainly a possibility. But these tissues are unbelievably friable. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. It's almost like Swiss cheese, and it's like inflamed. And, and the reason the data for the surgical literature is skewed, because the longer you wait, you select for somewhat healthier patients, right. patients who didn't have as much of an infarct. And if you're lucky enough to make it out that far, you're just a healthier group of patients. Almost everybody else dies within the first seven days. Uh, and, and even transcatheter closure, you know, technically, as you saw, it's very challenging. Usually, you have to come in retrograde to wire snare it, externalize it, and then bring the device up anagrade. Mm -hmm. is kind of the traditional method of doing it, which can be challenging, especially if, if you have fresh pacemaker leads. And, and you know what? The, it's either you do that and you risk losing one of the pacemaker and you save the guy's life, 
and then you can always put in a, uh, you know, another pace or a, a micro or something else afterwards is certainly a possibility. Uh, but even in those cases, it's very challenging. That it's, you don't have a discrete hole. It's a serpiginous hole uh, on one side, and over there you can actually see the trabeculations of the septum kind of coming apart mm. in some of the images that you showed us. So it is a very, very technical thing. And if you get the patient to survive that, then there's a risk of hemolysis, which is, can be pretty profound uh, in these post-infarct VSD devices. And so it's never really a satisfying thing to do. Uh, unless somebody has uh, like a pure congenital VSD, they're nice circumferential, and you can close those. So it's, it's I find them to be fascinating, so. One comment I want to make as the imager, um, these cases are incredibly challenging to image, but I find that when you have VSDs, um, oftentimes the transgastric pictures are really your working view. And um, so when we do these cases, I spend a lot of my time in the stomach. Mm -hmm. Uh, because you can see the, the the ventricular septum very well from there, especially if it's close to the tricuspid or the aortic valves. You want to make sure that none of the leaflets or subvalvular apparatus is involved with the closure. So oftentimes, as an imager, we spend a lot of time transgastric. And as someone who has uh, pulled the RV lead out doing an externalization for a VSD <laughs> repair, I will tell you it is, uh, I commend you for taking a step back. You know, it's important. A lot of times we like to present cases that of everything we can do, but sometimes we need to know what we should not do. So actually, I think that's actually a very powerful point. Yeah. Actually, I had one case was a LVAD patient who the, the pacemaker lead was chronic. And I think as a part of the LVAD insertion, when they inserted the LVAD, they uh, disrupted the, the interventricular septum. And so but the pacemaker had been in there for a long time, and we, I went ahead and did the VSD closure on the patient, and it so went fine, did okay, no problem, and he's in the recovery unit, and all of a sudden he's having heart, or he's having a heart block, he's basically having sinus arrest. Pacemaker's not capturing. It's the pacemaker lead banging up against the device was causing missense, and, and it, was, it was not capturing as a result, or not firing as a result of that, so they had to go in and re revise it, so it's very interesting. Great. Okay, so thank you. All right. All right. To close out the session, we have uh, tips and tricks for self-expandable valves in patients with challenging anatomy tavern bicuspid valve with steep torturous ascending aorta by Dr. Palma Dallin. Thank you for the presentation. Um, first of all, I would like to thank my structural team from my hospital for allowing me to present this case here. So on behalf of Dr. Chizani, Dr. Philby, and Dr. Kigui, I want to show this case, a very, very interesting case. And is this what thing? There's a large green button in the center. Yeah. yeah that, that, no, no, that, that green, the larger one. That big green, yeah, okay. that one. There you go. So I have no disclosures uh, regarding this presentation. So it's a 95-year-old male, it's very frail, with a history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation eliquis, hypertension, diastolic heart failure, and prior uh, pacemaker, and asthma, and, and uh, observed apnea. That came to our office for evaluation of severe AS with, uh, by that time, was a mean grade of 73, with the dimensionless index of 0 0.14. Reported dyspnea on exertion, walking 100 uh, feet, and dizziness and fatigue. Denied any other com other comorbidities. Uh, near heart cessation class two, fluid score three out of five, like a high fluid score, and he was paced because of the pacemaker, of course, and STS score of 3.2. Physical exam only the, the murmur was positive, everything else was negative, and the echo measurements uh, at the day of the procedure. The, it was a mean of 61 and a peak velocity of 5.2 with a moderate AR associated and mild MR and mild TR. So and this, is the, the, this is the angiogram showing that no, no significant coronary disease. And here are the measurements of the CT, the tavern CT, showing that a very heavily calcified uh, bicuspid valve, okay? So it's a fusion of the uh, left and the right cuspids and with a perimeter of 100 and an area of 789. So it's very large annually. So we had to decide at this point what would be the treatment, right? So the surgical team, they, re they, they refused the, the case because of the frailty of the patient, 95-year-old. And so we had to, to decide if we're, not, if we're going to proceed with the tavern and which valve to use. 
uh, we, uh, afterwards we selected uh, Evolute Pro Plus 34. Uh, I think there, there can have a, a large discussion which valve to use here, but uh, the attending physician was more comfortable. It's very important to be very comfortable with the device that you're using. And I think the feature of recapturing the valve was very important for this procedure because if something goes south, we can remove the valve and, and just keep with the BEV, right? So here is the access. The right was the primary, the left was the secondary. Here we can see the coplanar view, very horizontal aorta. So here's the aortogram showing a very horizontal aorta. So it's a very challenging case, bicuspid horizontal aorta. And then we did a pre deal with a 22 through deal balloon. And you can see the, the right uh, panel, uh, the calcium moving big time when we do the, the pre deal. And then we deployed the, the Evolute Pro Plus 34 device. So we can see very horizontal aorta and we successfully could were able to deploy. It was under um, um, uh, our mini minimalist approach with local anesthesia. Patient was awake, only with a small sedation. And this is the final, the final position of the device. So showing a uh, good, uh, good position. It was not moving at all. The final mean gradient of 11, if only trace PVL afterwards. So the follow-up, the patient uh, could uh, walk on the same day of the procedure. No, no other conduction disturbance disturbances size of the pacemaker that he had, no bleedings. Next day, the TE was consistent with the one before, with a gradient, or, uh, mean gradient of around 11, and the patient was discharged at home on the next day uneventfully. So take home message is that uh, tyrant is a safe and reasonable approach for bicuspid aortic valves with unfavorable anatomy uh, if the patient is not suitable for a surgical AVR. The self-expandable versus the balloon expandable valve should be discussed and the treatment must be individualized based on the anatomy and the characteristics of the patient. And the multidisciplinary team should always be involved for the decision making of the, of the case. Thank you very much. It was a great uh, presentation, and uh, your center is uh, nationally recognized for its uh, strong skill and competency with the use of self-expanding TAVR valves. Uh, for me, uh, being comfortable with both valves, this case would have been a balloon expandable case all day long, but it's uh, obviously up to the operator, and I won't hold you responsible for <laughs> your attending's decision, which clearly proved to be a successful outcome. Um, full responsibility for the actions <laughs> of the attending. Right. But, um, you know, really in these cases, there's a lot of technical factors. If I could just make a few comments about this and I'll pass it off to the other panelists or the audience. The degree of curvature of the lesser curve of the aorta is really the most important piece to this horizontal aorta taver case puzzle. The second comment I'll make is that obviously, uh, in addition to the horizontal nature of the aorta, such as in your patient, you naturally are going to be looking at valve characteristics. You know, is there LVOT calcium? Is there annular calcium? How high is the gradient? Do you have to do pre-BAV um, or post-dilatation if you go with a self-expanding valve, which uh, sometimes can be necessary, which also increases the risk of embolization of the self-expanding valve with uh, post-dilatation, coronary heights, all those other factors that we always look at with TAVR CT scans. So. Uh, overall, uh, these cases can be challenging. I personally have found in my own individual practice that balloon expandable valves um, allows me to, you know, do these cases with less uh, uh, of a uh, puckering moment during mm -hmm. during the case. But but certainly, self expanding valve technology has its benefits as well, and it just comes down to the competency and comfort level of the operator and the and Perfect. the team. I completely agree with the comments, and I think the new the new platform, the FX, the, it's much more stable. So I think for these cases, you have more stability, and we can deliver like a, a my, my, can have a more uh, predictable. predictable yeah, approach. So Ashley, I was just going to comment on that the FX platform is definitely going to be much more stable, and it's going to be the spine, the single spine, is going to make a big difference. Yeah, I would have done self-expanding all day here, actually. So I think it's a perfect choice and a good, really nice result. Uh, Thank you, everybody. That's the session. Next session is at 3.30. We'll be taking donations if... Uh,
Somebody wants to be selected as top two. Give it to the Rahul Sharma one.